Hi, I'm Jeff Denworth, Chief Marketing Officer, co-founder of Vast Data. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the Vast Data space, which is our approach to building a global system that allows you to access and process your data from anywhere. First, it's important to establish the principles by which we build all of our technologies with. And first, we're looking to really simplify every single aspect of data processing and computing. Data space is a global approach to essentially breaking down barriers to accessing data really all around the world. And so that definitely conforms to that first principle. Second is embracing standards. And particularly when you start thinking about different cloud environments that you may want to run applications in or put your data in, APIs and all these different technologies tend to confuse the process of normalizing your application environment. And here we're bringing all standard protocols, NAS, object, database to the table to make things simpler for customers so that they don't have to worry about the different APIs in any environment. And finally, we're always about enabling ownership, ownership of your data where you get to decide where it's stored and where it's accessed from. We're not offering a service where we are the stewards of your data, but rather we're providing you the tools to deploy infrastructure in the places of your choosing. And that is a critical aspect of the vast data space, particularly now as we're entering into the cloud. I'll talk about that in a moment. So the goal of the product is really to unlock access to your data from anywhere from edge to cloud. There's a lot of conversation in the marketplace today around data gravity. It makes a lot of sense. People have large data stores that are typically difficult to move from cloud to cloud to cloud or on-premises to cloud or vice versa. Not enough conversation happening right now about something that I call compute gravity. And here there's a number of different reasons why it needs to be a topic of conversation today. If you think about it, first of all, from a supply chain perspective, it's very difficult to get your hands on a lot of processors that you may need in, on, in a quick manner. Imagine you need a, uh, to run a new deep learning workload and it requires a thousand GPUs. You can either wait six to nine months for those to arrive to your doorstep, or you can just go run this job in some cloud that has those resources readily available. On top of it, if you think about supply chain considerations, that's something that customers are wrestling with every day. And if you have the ability to just move data where you need it to, you can start to alleviate some of those challenges. And then finally, there's the idea of resource utilization. Customers have on-premises data centers, not typically not just one, oftentimes they have many distributed around the world, and they have cloud resources that are available to them. And if you think about resource utilization, there's all sorts of variability from data center to data center. And we wanted to basically build an approach that allowed for better utilization by being able to move the data to the compute in cases where that made more sense. Thinking across all these different types of infrastructures, we started to talk with customers about all the different places that they stored and they computed on their data. And here you have silos of infrastructure that get built, uh, particularly from a data management perspective, from data center to data center to data center. That made a lot of sense. We really wanted to unify all of this so people could see their data from anywhere. But then as we started to think about and work with customers on their public cloud endeavors, what we saw is that APIs became a critical consideration to dealing with all these different cloud platforms. And each cloud vendor has their own APIs that they want to support. And at the end of the day, that makes it really difficult for customers to move their applications from here to there in cases where there's a business re to reason to do so. As we started to look at this, we realized not only did we need to abstract the idea of locality away from the compute agenda, but we also needed to normalize and simplify the presentation of data as customers started to work from edge to cloud across all these different data center platforms that they could work with. So we wanted to build a global namespace. But global namespaces historically have been really hard to build. And I'll break it down in very simple terms. If you think about distributed storage systems, what you have is um, two types of operations. The simplest level, you have reads that will happen across the different sites that you may want to deploy and distribute storage to. Oftentimes, global namespaces are built with caches, and read caches are pushed to the edge so that applications that want to get access to data can do simple operations reading data. Now, reads are easy to manage because you don't have a consistency problem, typically. On the flip side, you have write operations or transactional events that can happen. The vast data store supports file and object formats. The vast data base supports tabular formats. In all three cases, consistency is a challenge that all of your applications deal with as they start to think about how to work with data sets that get distributed across multiple cloud platforms. So just think about it if you have an edge site that you want to go write to. That write will have to be checked into some other site that otherwise owns or takes responsibility over a piece of data that may be cached at the edge of a network. At that point, once you have a bunch of different systems that all need to keep in concert with each other, 
consistency drags the IO operations down to the performance of the wide area network. And that becomes the lowest common denominator that all of these systems work against. In that regard, writes have been slow forever with global namespace products. And it really hasn't worked for organizations that want to build web scale, globally distributed AI computers. AI computers can't compute at the speed of a wide area network. So that was the challenge that we really needed to solve with the vast data space. And so what did we do? We built beyond. So the data spaces are essentially our fabric that interconnects all the different systems into one global presentation of your data. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going from edge now to cloud. And the objective here is to really build a system that broke the fundamental trade-off that exists between performance that you should be able to get at the edge of the network and the consistency that gets enforced across all the different sites that you may want to process your data on. So how does it work? Well, here we borrowed from principles that were really pioneered in the Web3 computing space. And what we've done is we've changed the dynamics of lock management across a collection of data centers at the most fundamental level. No longer are we doing things like making one site the sole exclusive owner of a piece of data, and all the other sites need to check into that site in order to transact consistently into the network. Now we can, with the vast data space, essentially decentralize that process and delegate authority over a piece of data within the namespace to a remote site that may want to go and transact or write into the global data space. And so as a result, what we can do is we can push the, the serialization of that operation all the way out to the edge of the network. And it's not like we're allowing that site to take total control over the entirety of the namespace. What we've done is we've brought locking down on a global basis all the way to a per file a per object or a per table basis. And so that fine granularity of locking allows for all the sites to go and transact into different parts of the system. And in the very random case where you might have two sites that want to overwrite precisely the same pieces of data at the same piece of, at the same time, the granularity of the lock management allows for all of those sites to do that in a consistent fashion. Locking is one aspect of the system. Other sites that may actually want to go and just keep representations of that data such that their applications are periodically reading from the data, they'll take what we call leases. And leases happen all over the network. And when one site wants to go and actually update a piece of data or delete a piece of data, the first thing that they do, that loaner is how we call it, the first thing that they'll do is they'll go and revoke the leases that all of the other sites have on that file, that object, or that table. So it's, again, it's a super fine grain operation but we can enforce consistency by giving the remote site that wants to transact not only the ability to handle locking locally, but also to enforce lease management across the entire network so that every site sees a consistent representation of data. Does every site need to peer with every other site and synchronize or mirror each other's data? Absolutely not. It's a very flexible approach to essentially peering different subsets of the data sets into additional remote sites that you may have. And so, on a path basis, and you can think of a path as just a view into the system that might be a directory or that may be a, a table or that may be a bucket that you store your objects in, a remote site can say, okay, I want to view into this piece of data. And at that point, they establish a peering relationship and the granularity can be as fine-grained as you'd like it to. And other sites can come into the network and subscribe to the same paths or different paths. And basically every site chooses the data that they want to go and view and share across this global data space. Now, in terms of synchronization, the way that it works is that each site will keep a cached representation of the metadata structures such that at the highest levels, every site can see every other site's data. But as I mentioned earlier, we're not necessarily mirroring data. What we're doing is we're providing the access over the wide area network to some data that may not be in a, in a remote systems cache. And so here we have a number of intelligent prefetch algorithms that we built into the system such that uh, on a first request, Obviously, there's a little bit of latency with respect to time to first byte, but these prefetch algorithms will keep the pipes as full as we can possibly keep them, such that you don't really have a lot of wait time when you're accessing a piece of remote data. Now, that may not be good enough for certain applications or certain environments where you want to have the data there precisely at the moment where you start computing. And for this reason, we have a collection of essentially APIs and different tunables that you can put into the system to ensure that the data will be at the site you want it to be at, at the time you need to start computing on it. One of the mechanisms that we use to enforce this is an integration with different job schedulers or application schedulers or orchestration systems 
that are responsible for queuing up and deploying applications in different places. And so using popular job schedulers like Run AI or Slurm or NVIDIA's base command, you can imagine that as a, a user comes in and queues up their job and they articulate which directories they want available for that computing event, we can listen to those and make sure that the data is where it needs to be, when it needs to be there in advance of the job actually running. And so this is a nice integration with high-scale computing engines that really makes it possible to do burst computing. And one of the other consistency modes that I didn't talk about is cloning. And here, um, we can establish a relationship between two sites where maybe you don't want to share data and keep everything totally consistent. You want a remote site that can take a clone on a piece of data and start writing into that clone instantaneously. That's another mode of synchronization that we support. And obviously, clones are essentially desynchronized because you're taking a snapshot of a data and you're representing it new elsewhere. But the cloning operation can happen in very, very fast time. Uh, and it's another way to go and test and work on data sets that you may not want to keep participant in some other part of the live namespace. So starting today, we're really excited to announce support for different cloud platforms that you can now deploy the vast data platform from. The data space allows you to extend into cloud platforms such as Microsoft Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform. And here, as we start, we'll basically build small representations of the namespace that you can build as single nodes, and then we'll scale up to many as many nodes as you'd like to in large clusters that you can deploy in the clouds of your choosing. The nice thing about this is now we've normalized all the APIs across all the different clouds that you may want to deploy your data services from, and it allows you to move data in and out of clouds when you want to use these platforms for burst computing. And this just becomes part of a larger strategy that we have where we've built and support for systems that are in your edge data centers. So that may be, for example, Mercury Computer that we work with for ruggedized systems. That may be HPE. Your on-prem larger data centers. And so here we have support for all sorts of different compute storage and networking providers like HPE, AIC, Lenovo, and networking providers like NVIDIA and Arista. And now we're stitching together the cloud platforms that you may compute in into one unified namespace that runs across all of this in a seamless fashion. The last thing that we're announcing with respect to the Vast Data Platform is the Vast Data Engine. And this is the mechanism that will essentially allow us to bring compute to the system, add functions and triggers, and these functions and triggers run on top of your data, basically bring real-time computing to your data store. If you think about the data space, the data space leads a global foundation for us to essentially go and deploy your data anywhere. The engine comes in on top of this and is that distributed compute layer that sits on top of your data that can be anywhere. And so now you can essentially move your data to the compute when you want to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes compute has gravity, but the vast data engine also allows us to bring your compute to the data. And the interesting thing about this is once you've unified compute and data together in a unified data platform, you have a system that is really topographically aware, and we can make the best possible decisions by understanding where the physical resources are from a processing perspective, your CPUs, your GPUs, and your DPUs, as well as from a data perspective. Caching gateways are great because they articulate all of your data to all the different sites that you may want to access your data with, but caching gateways also lie to you because they say, I've got all your data, and that may be not in San Francisco or London, it may be in, I don't know, Singapore. And so by understanding where the physical placement of that data actually is, we can essentially not only provide a global view of your data, but we can articulate to the compute engine where the best possible place is to actually run your applications. And so now we've basically solved for both data gravity and compute gravity in a single unified solution as we bring together the vast data space with the vast data engine. And that's the story. It's a unified system that provides access to your data anywhere. It's a simple approach to managing your data from edge to cloud with a unified set of APIs. And we've solved for the problems and the challenges of transactional performance and consistency such that you no longer need to worry about where your data is. You get fast access from anywhere you want to compute on your data with the vast data space. I invite you to go watch the videos for the vast days architecture, which is the foundation that we can build web scale computers with. The Vast Data Store, which is the file system and object storage layer that is designed to hold all of your unstructured natural data. The Vast Data Base, the contextual layer that we layer on top of the system so you can break the trade-offs between transactional and analytical databases with one system that's designed to work 
in conjunction with the vast data store. And finally, the vast data engine, which is the compute layer of the system that brings life to your data by adding functions and triggers and essentially allows for you to compute on your data in real time from anywhere across the vast data space. Thank you.